and a very good morning to everybody. Uh, my name is Sunita Singh, and uh, I work with the Vadwani Foundation, the global not-for-profit organization which works in the around the critical mission of job creation through startups and small business development and growth. Uh, we work across 20 countries around the world, and it's a real pleasure to be here in Africa working with so many great partners and, uh, you know, individual uh, uh, ambassadors of entrepreneurship. Uh, the foundation's chairman, Dr. Ramesh Vadwani, just to give you a little bit of a background on him, he's a first-generation Silicon Valley serial entrepreneur and uh, has built uh, several companies over over the past uh, 45, uh, 45 years. Uh, and along with Bill Gates and Warren Buffet, he's part of the giving pledge. And as part of that, he's pledged uh, a large part of all of his wealth for social good. So we're very privileged to have his support in order to you know, uh, work on this mission that we truly believe in. Um, you know, very interestingly, the foundation focused on this mission much before it became a talking point at the World Economic Forum, as well as with, uh, you know, the other organizations and bodies around the world. Um, and uh, over these years, we have worked across several emerging economies. Anyway, moving on, uh, let me just quickly share with you what the foundation's team looks like uh, in East and Southern Africa, which is what we are representing here. Uh, we represent six different nationalities. There's Charles, uh, who's here. Uh, and Kalela from South Africa, Michael, who's a US citizen with a Kenyan family, Sandra from Uganda, Patrice from Rwanda, and Shambhavi and myself from India. And it's really a huge privilege to have all of you here, particularly because, you know, we believe that uh, amongst the participants, we have a lot of very inspired young people, people who, who are aspiring to be entrepreneurs, as well as those who have started small businesses already. Uh, and of course, it's a absolute pleasure and, you know, uh, uh, a big thank you to all the panelists, all of you esteemed uh, people who work in the space of entrepreneurship and who are willing to share your knowledge uh, and your experiences with uh, all of us here. So let me quickly begin by introducing the panelists um, and then we'll quickly launch into the, into the discussion itself. Uh, we have here Ian, Ian Lorenzen, Executive Director and Partner at Growth Africa, uh, which is a leading East African impact accelerator for post-revenue, ambitious, innovative, and scalable ventures. Ian has been an entrepreneur and he's an innovator at heart, co-founded several businesses as well as worked with entrepreneurial ventures in Denmark, Philippines, and East Africa. That's a very interesting combination of, of places where you have worked, Ian. Welcome. Uh, we have here also with us Mark Frankel, CEO of Black Umbrellas, a South African enterprise development innovation organization, which partners with the private sector, government, and civil society. Black Umbrella addresses a very important challenge in Africa, particularly in South Africa, uh, which is of handling the low levels of entrepreneurship and to decrease the failure rates of 100% Black-owned emerging businesses in the African continent. Mark has previously worked with diverse organizations, including the Bank of New Zealand and Oxfam. Again, lovely to have you here with us, Mark. Welcome. We're really That's very happy awesome. to... Pleasure. Uh, we're very happy to introduce to you uh, I hope I get getting the, I make a mistake. Mathabishi Bukete, a young entrepreneur from Botswana who's making waves in the region. Did I get that right? You did. Yes, it's Mathabishi Bukete. Okay, Bukete. <laughs> uh, Mathabishi has founded Digital Natives and he did this while he was still a student in Mauritius. Digital Natives describes itself as a group of talented young individuals who have a deep-seated mission to be one of the largest tech product companies in Southern African region. We love digital natives outlook as they describe themselves as being relentless, bold, pursuing, borderless strategies. Welcome. 
And last but not the least, we have here with us Yop Zuki, a Swiss-born investor and entrepreneur who's worked in Africa since 2007. So you're very much an African by now. He started numerous businesses, healthcare, IT, tourism, academia, etc., and has seen both successes and failures. Well, who hasn't, I suppose. Very interestingly, York is passionate about Africa and coffee and believes that the right mixture of these three will make Africa the continent to be in for the next 20 years. In 2016, he also co-founded the Global SME Movement, an initiative to fix the SME support ecosystem with a particular focus on access to market. Welcome, Yog. So once again, welcome everybody. A very good morning and let's begin. Charles and myself, we are here and I'm going to just open the panel and hand this over to Charles so he can, you know, then lead the discussion with a much stronger and deeper context of Africa. All right. So let me throw a first question at you. Given that we have three people here on the panel who are leading support intermediaries and investors for startups and small businesses, both in East Africa and in the Southern African region, let me begin by asking Ian, Mark, and Yo to open the panel by talking about what's actually happening in the startup ecosystem in the regions that you work in. What is the entrepreneurial activity looking like, both your past entrepreneurs that you've worked with and invested in, as well as the new that are actually coming up? What do you see as the immediate future for both existing and for new startups? Over to you. Who wants to go first? Yeah, Mark. Uh, let me give a, a go at it then. Um, All right. I think being an being an entrepreneur, I, I I tend to look at opportunities, and I really think this this time, as much as definitely a challenging time, I think it actually holds one of great opportunities, and perhaps opportunities that we are not going to see, hopefully, in some weird way, uh, in our lifetime again. So I do think that for the right entrepreneurs with the right innovations, the right disruptions. I think actually we're not going to find a better time that we have now. Um, the challenges that we're seeing, I think, are not necessarily new. Um, all of us are, are only too familiar with funding and financing being a challenge, but that was almost a default of one that we had pre-COVID as well. So that's not born out of COVID. COVID probably made it a little bit harder right now, but I do think that we are seeing a, a bouncing back coming on now. Um, and the money is still there, need to be deployed, it's, it will be deployed. Um, so I don't think we're going to see that situation being harder than it was pre-COVID. Um, I think we're going to see that a lot of young people, a lot of young businesses are a lot better responding to the challenges that we're seeing right now. And that's also what, what makes me smile and, and think that this is actually that opportunity rather than something where we're seeing a lot of uh, startups going out of market, going out of business. Uh, I think we've actually seen very encouraging that the business we're working with actually staying a lot more afloat and getting in there more than we had anticipated. Um, and also the ability to actually serve their clients, pivot and find new ways of, of getting to markets have been remarkable. So I, I, don't, I don't look at this with um, a dark lens. I actually look at this with quite some opportunities ahead of us. Um, that doesn't mean that there isn't challenges, but I think they're actually perhaps more of a come by by the energy and, and the innovation that we're seeing among startups and, and especially young people who also perhaps are better at, at working with change. Whereas um, I think it's fair to say when you get more seasoned, change is not necessarily the, the favorite dish. Um, so we're not always agile as, as an ability to, to change as I think a lot of, of young businesses and young people are. But let me that be that my lead in and then uh, I'd love to hear what the rest of you have of thoughts. Sure, and we'll come back to you to pick up on some of those points. But uh, uh, yo, Mark, which of you want to go next? Go for it, Mark. Um, yeah, thanks very much. So I don't know. It's I mean, it's obviously been a very interesting and challenging time. Um, I know there's a cliche, you know, floating around, you know, that says never waste a good crisis. So I think that's exactly it. And, I suppose one could liken it to a personal health situation, you know, where you know you shouldn't eat certain things and you should get more exercise, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not really until you have a health scare, such as a heart attack, et cetera, when you actually start doing something about it. So I think that's reflective both of 
uh, the environment for small businesses um, and small businesses themselves. So if you look at the environment, there were obviously um, a large number of initiatives underway. Um, it's always been an initiative both of uh, the environment for small businesses um, and small businesses themselves. So if you look at the environment, there were obviously um, a large number of initiatives underway. Um, it's always been an initiative both of uh, the environment for small businesses um, and small businesses themselves. So sorry, I'm feeling as the environment, they were obviously- um, We can still hear you, Mark, go ahead. lag on my side, I'm not sure what's happening. Exactly. Um, it's always been an initiative both of uh, the environment for small businesses. Um, Mark, maybe you have another device on. So, sorry, I'm feeling as if not, it might be Charles's. I still hear you, Mark. Go ahead. There's a lag on my side. I'm not sure what's happening. Oh, okay. um, I'm not sure. It's, it's, it's playing back my voice in the background. The yeah, it seems to be playing back. Um, Mark, yeah. maybe you have another it's device on. So, sorry, I'm feeling if not, it might be Charles's. I'm not sure. It's playing back my voice in the background. Yeah. Oh, Mark, maybe just mute your mic, or maybe let everyone mute yeah. their mic so you can stop them. If not, it might be Charles. Let me just take a I'm not sure it's playing back my voice in the background. Yeah. Mark, maybe just mute your mic, or maybe let everyone mute their mic so you can stop them. If not, it might be Charles. Let me just take a moment. If I mute to yeah. Mark, maybe just mute your mic, or maybe let everyone mute and mute their mic so you can stop them. If not, it might be Charles. Let me just hear you. I'm mute. So, we we're just waiting for Mark, or I'm sorry, I, I may have lost a little bit uh, the the flow. Uh, there was a strange uh, feedback. Um, Zoom's the only app open on my laptop and my phone is off, so I don't think it's from my side. Okay, we can hear you, Mark. You want to continue? Okay. All right, okay, so let me just make that a bit shorter. Apologies for that. Um, so, yeah, so I think there were a lot of initiatives underway uh, beforehand, um, but those have obviously been accelerated and emphasized now. So both from the government side I think the corporate sector in South Africa is still lagging a bit, um, but from the development side, there's certainly a lot of activity happening. And I think if anything, COVID's emphasized the need for collaboration and scaling. So whereas previously people were doing things in silos to a large extent and quite protective of what they were doing, I think now, and it's probably also the results of uh, the impact of a crisis as well, you know, people, uh, become softer towards each other. Obviously, you start reprioritizing things in your life, et cetera, et cetera. So from our side, we're seeing a lot more collaboration. We're seeing a lot more willingness to work together. We're seeing people getting an understanding of where they are in the ecosystem um, and how they can position themselves to assist others, um, you know, both in terms of pipeline and I suppose in terms of output from their programs. And then on the small business side, it's also, you know, it's all the good things we talk about in terms of small business, stay lean, stay agile, um, manage your expenses as efficiently as possible, diversify your customer base. So when times are good, one doesn't necessarily need to make those a priority in the business if things are going okay. But if times are not so great, then um, they're obviously increased in terms of prioritization. So, so there's a definite mindset around um, re-looking at your business, um, seeing what's not necessary, um, seeing where you can double up, seeing where you can shed, et cetera, et cetera. So the important thing would be to you know, keep that mindset moving out of this environment. So run as lean and mean and agile as possible, look to diversify your customer base, look to expand beyond local borders. So all the things we're doing as an imperative to survive now are probably actually good um, business practice. And, you know, it would be important to keep that in mind moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Jörg? Uh, okay, so from my okay. side, uh, I, for me, the, the three fundamentals of an effective uh, small business support ecosystem is really access to knowledge, access to finance, 
and access to markets, meaning how, clients. And if we exactly what Mark is saying and what Ian brought in right at the beginning is we're seeing a fundamental, incredibly uh, quick rate of change, like Professor Galloway in America says, COVID isn't changing the world, it's just accelerating the rate of change. And we as entrepreneurs, as business people are inherently lazy. Um, we want to find shortcuts. We don't want to change our patterns and our routines. We want to spend two years looking for funding instead of spending six months looking for a client on the back of which we can get financing. So we're seeing that uh, the, 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 the cooking pot of entrepreneurship has been stirred. And actually, those um, who, who are real entrepreneurs now are, are coming out. You can see that they're saying, hold on, access to knowledge. I can get now knowledge left, right, and center. Everybody is preparing online courses. There is all kind of stuff that I can get at the tip of my fingertips when I need it. Um, access to markets, finding clients, it's become easier than ever. The engagement bridges, we can talk later during the Q&A, but engagement bridges are even easier to realize because people now have found time to start connecting where before, I don't know, a Mark was in his ivory tower in Cape Town at the top of Black Umbrellas. <laughs> Sorry, Mark, just using you. Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, York wasn't able to access him. Now Mark is sitting much more at home, uh, looking at opportunities, seeing messages on social media, engaging. And when you create engagement, you create a bridge with which to build a relationship on which to hopefully one day sell. So I'm really um, quite positive, not that it is pain painless, not that it is pleasant. I'm not suggesting in any way transformation is easy. And a lot of people who lost their jobs are suffering badly, but it might just be the best thing that has happened to us as entrepreneurs. Oh, that's very interesting to say. And uh, I think all of you are echoing that thought that, uh, uh, you know, despite uh, whatever challenges the world is facing, uh, this is possibly a great time with wonderful opportunities for entrepreneurs and small businesses. So before we uh, go further on this, and I'm sure Charles is going to come back and pick up on a lot of points that you've raised here, but uh, let's, let's get some opening remarks from uh, Matabishi here. Um, you have a very interesting technology company that you're building and you're serving the region from Botswana. That itself is, is really interesting to me that you're working out of a smaller country but serving the entire region. Uh, would you please give the listeners a sense of how this has come about and when you talk of your borderless strategies, how were they working earlier and you know what difference are you seeing in these times uh, now? Is it easier? Is it more difficult? What's actually happening? Okay, so my company is actually in two countries, uh, in Mauritius and in Botswana. i um, actually opening up my third branch in South Africa next year. I was supposed to do it this year, but again, COVID. Um, basically, we, <laughs> we really specialize on like disruptive technologies. We've built three different softwares which have all won different awards. Uh, the first one won Huawei's most innovative app competition in Mauritius, uh, countrywide. Recently, we also won the uh, hotel startup upper competition. It gave us 120,000 gula to develop an electricity application that remotely tops up your meters. It warns you, it does like uh, machine learning algorithms that learn your usage habits and then uh, gives you guys optimized ways of using electricity. And then just last month, we won the SADIC the whole region of SADIC's uh, uh, investment and innovation in financial identity uh, with an application called Digital Diamond. Um, what it does is it basically simplifies KYC across borders. So when you go to different countries, you don't necessarily need to carry your KYC documents. You have this unique ID that basically pulls all that information to these various uh, entities and it's becoming compliant with various uh, bodies. Um, we then, like, that was on the software components, and I did mention we also innovate on hardware. We are the first company to design and bring in a digital truck. What this is, is basically a truck that has, like, LEDs embedded in, into it, and then it emits Wi-Fi, right? So what happens is Botswana has a low Wi-Fi reach outside, not into your home, but, like, outside in the streets. 
So what this truck does is when it's parking to advertise, uh, it gives Wi-Fi to the people around it, bringing a crowd, uh, creating connectivity, things like that. Um, the use cases are endless. In fact, we recently used pivoting to do open an open cinema. So like at universities, you just park the car there, people pay like 50 bucks and then you just park your car and march on the truck. It has sound on both ends. And we also developing a software to remotely uh, monitor and top up the ads. So meaning users no longer have to come to us. They just go to our website and they can just select which truck in which country they want to advertise on. And then they can advertise through wherever they are sitting from home. It just verifies and then it says, this is the slot you'll get for this long and then you pay it all digitally without like least amount of a transaction. And a little bit about myself as well. I was recently nominated to be Forbes 30 under 30 in the technology sector. And uh, uh, also this is a hush hush, but it's a recent appointment as the youngest board of director at Standard Bank in Botswana. So those are a few of the little things that I'm doing on the back. I don't have time to really put all this on LinkedIn or something like that because the workload is intense as, as, yeah. But in terms of like business here in Botswana and Mauritius, it's, it's going quite well. Thank you and congratulations on your newest achievements and we hope that there'll be many more to come. Um, uh, over to you, Charles, do you want to come in and pick up from here? Sure. With the stronger you, African context, yeah. Thank you, Sunita. Uh, Thanks to our panelists, uh, guys, you've all provided us with a very insightful view from your, each of your perspective regarding the key challenges and uh, you know, what's facing entrepreneurs during this pandemic, uh, pandemic uh, period that we're all facing around the world. Um, but I believe, there, as I think um, many of you have mentioned, there are opportunities that came about due to uh, COVID-19. Um, well, from each of you, just give us a little bit of a, your own view. What do you, what do you uh, think are some of those opportunities that can be explored by entrepreneurs or have been explored by entrepreneurs over the last, uh, let's call it six to nine months? And going forward, what do you believe would be the, uh, the growth sectors due to this pandemic? Mark, can we start with you? Uh, yeah, sure, Charles. Thanks very much. So I think... I mean, there's a number of opportunities, really. Um, the first, obviously, is in terms of market reach um, through the digitization that's happening you know, in this space. So, so on the one hand, you've got a number of platforms that are being developed to help um, you know, small businesses have digital storefronts, um, one of which, which we're you know, kind of in the early stages of working with is a platform called Little Fish. I don't know if anybody's heard about it, but it basically enables your neighborhood store to both connect with their suppliers and their customers on the digital platform. <clears throat> so simplistically, instead of putting your sandwich board outside your store where you're writing your daily specials on there, you're basically you know, able to put that on the web. Um, as part of their COVID offering, they've made it free for the first couple of months. So, I mean, just as an indication, first month they had 200 businesses on the platform. Next month they had 2,000 businesses on the platform. So, so I think there's a whole number of uh, routes to market um, that are opening up for small businesses, which you know weren't there beforehand. So that's the one angle. The other angle is, and that's something that we focus on quite a lot, is there needs to be an imperative around localization of supply chain. So. Um, once the COVID lockdown started happening, I think it became evident, you know, to what extent businesses within South Africa, and I suppose Africa as a whole, had um, basically outsourced their supply chain to China to a large extent, and many countries outside of China. And that kind of showed the cracks in that solution, because single source supplying from non-local companies, you know, proved to be inherently risky, because once the borders were closed, there was no more supply of those goods coming in effectively and everything came to a grinding halt. So in South Africa, we've been working on this concept of enterprise and supplier development for many years. It certainly hasn't got to the level where it should be. If one looks at the amount of money that's been invested into it, you know, the effort that's been put into it. But I think, you know, COVID's now, um, it's now emphasized the need to look at localization of supply chains and to 
mitigate the risk within your supply chain and your procurement strategy, you need to start building in development of local suppliers and looking at import replacements. So I think, you know, there's a potential opportunity for small businesses as well. And that needs to be a coordinated effort, obviously driven by the corporates, by governments, um, development organizations such as ourselves and the small businesses. So I think the door is open. I think the opportunities are there, but now, you know, it's up to us to make sure that we convert them. Thanks for that, Mark. No, I agree with you there. There's still a lot of work to be done, but definitely through collaboration, you know, and uh, taking hands, I think we, we've we got a, a unique opportunity to go forward. Um, I'm going to go back to Matabisi. Matabisi, you being the entrepreneur amongst us here. <laughs> Can you give us your view on that? What was, uh, from your side, what do you think was an opportunity that came about due to COVID and going forward? Where do you see the, uh, the opportunities for entrepreneurs in Africa? In fact, um, I see it a lot in the creative space because uh, what people don't actually realize is that universities, corporates alike, are all now trying to digitalize their businesses, whether it's through training, to teaching, through onboarding and things like that. So that content creation of that, like the videos, the audios, the strategy, that if somebody was like aligning themselves in that space, maybe they have a pool of 30, 50, 60 creatives that just go to one university and digitalize every single course. That, that already is a good enough um, opportunity for like 60 to 70 uh, students. Cause you know, the students and, and the course is always different, they're always new and it's nice to have both animation, both visual, both wording. I feel like the creative space there is untapped, even in the financial institutions where they are also trying to do a lot of training, teaching, upskilling, all that, all that content creation could really be uh, capitalized on. Um, over and above that, I think even just as a general entrepreneur, <laughs> our weaknesses are our strengths, right? So including adversities, when there's an adversity, there's always an opportunity. It's like this, it's just like that dire parallel, black, um, darkness, light, that kind of thing. It's very, very consistent in that way. So when I see, when I see uh, situations like this happening, I can't stop to think, what are we missing? Like there's always a reason behind this. Uh, the manufacturing industry, specifically in Botswana, is now booming. Like people are now like, okay, I can build a company. Our CEDA has now, uh, Citizen Economic Development Authority, is now giving out grants and loans to help people build and manufacture these things. So there's less importation, like Mark rightly said, uh, internalizing your management to change the supply. Like that is very, very important. And that's another uh, opportunity. But that's for some people as well, but outside their reach, depends. I was going, like trying to suggest lower hanging fruits that they can build up off of and try to reach those areas. Because um, again, in every, in every uh, opportunity, in every business, you do need a level of capital, uh, of course, but and some people don't, especially in Botswana, we don't necessarily have land or assets that we can always rely on to push a specific product or thing. You may be lucky if you're, yeah, it's like if you worked your nine to five, you saved your money, you didn't spend, you lived frugally, then you decided, hey, look, let me buy this one product and start selling it, and then start scaling from there. You know. So, if if you had to uh, pinpoint one specific sector, what would that be? Growth going forward due to COVID nineteen. What sector do you think has got the most potential for growth going forward? Oh, um, it's it's, uh, it's quite difficult, but I would say creative. But then again, that's just that they have the mindset to adapt to this specific challenge. Like they they can see the opportunity, but that can rapidly grow, like to the point where you might find every university has a digital platform based, built by the students that they're teaching themselves or just by entrepreneurs on the side. Definitely Thanks in that space. That. Thanks, Matabisi. Uh, York, I know you're very passionate about um, sharing your experiences and sharing your skills as an entrepreneur with other entrepreneurs. Um, give us your view on that. Um, you know, what was the, in your perspective, the biggest opportunity that originated from the COVID uh, situation <coughs> going forward, forward. but um, um, yeah, I'd like to hear your, your take on this, York. Okay, so I'm a little bit of a contrarian in this space. I Words like supply chain, big corporates, governments have been thrown around. And while they are certainly important in, in an entrepreneur's ambitions to grow, 
and uh, and create partnership and expand i i believe that the majority of startups of young people who are entering the entrepreneurial space are not ready for corporate supply chains and so pursuing or, or planting the seed of you want to start supplying standard bank botswana or you want to start supplying what, whatever the organization is is wonderful but it's leading down the wrong path. What COVID has brought to us is actually something amazing, which is a shift from B to B to B to B to SME. I'll give you a practical example. All of us here have worked from home or from, from something, but we shifted away from being uh, in, a, in, a, in a big building in a center in downtown Johannesburg or Santon or Cape Town or Gaborone or wherever, we shifted away from being locked in a big building with gatekeepers to now sitting at home. So now look at me, for example, I set up a home office, my vegetables get developed by a young lady from Deep Sloot. Uh, the meals are pre-made every day so that I can focus much more on work by uh, a lady, another uh, woman-owned business. And so suddenly where these suppliers, let's call them, were trying to, uh, to tackle the companies where I was sitting in and going through supply chain, onboarding, uh, risk profiling, background checks and so forth. Now they're touching base with me directly I buy straight away from them. And the, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity for really startups, small businesses to start getting commercial traction. I'm not saying that's the, 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 the ideal. I'm not saying that's what's gonna grow you internationally. But you know, when you start having one client, five clients, then 20 clients, you also start to learn what clients really want, how to find you, you have cash flow. You start having a track record with your bank, uh, with your financials. It's all stuff that allows you to, to grow to the next step. That's why my view is always entrepreneurship is composed of thousands of tiny steps and not one giant lucky break. No, that's true. I think I, most of us agree with you on that. What did you say is going forward the biggest uh, opportunity for entrepreneurs that originated from the COVID uh, situation that we are in? Is it, Focus is it, is, on, yeah. No, no, I was just going to so, say. Is it, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, apologies. No, is it going to be, uh, in your case, like you said, you know, dealing direct with your clients, perhaps, um, on a specific focus, you know, whether it's in IT or food supply, do you think going to the, the direct user is a, an opportunity going forward? Or will that be a bit of a shared view when it go either going corporate business to business or business to straight let's call it end user so so it's such a expensive question it's difficult for me to answer it because the space for everybody however um and this is where ian will not really like my approach uh the biggest opportunity i see is for people to <clears throat> temper their ambitions and enthusiasms and by that i mean focus on selling one client at a time, no matter how small. That of course also brings your, your approach has to change. Where before you were trying to get a, a 10,000, 100,000, a 1 million, doesn't matter what the amount is, <clears throat> contract, now you are selling five cups at a time to a York who needs them. And if you can now package your service and your products I mean, a much more flexible way where York doesn't need to buy the whole kitchen, but can just buy a cup, a coffee machine and a spoon and can be much more selective. Uh, you start actually building an upselling relationship. So that to me is the biggest opportunity. No. Excellent. Ian, what's your take on that? I think that's a really interesting element. And I think when we pick up the last one, I think uh, relations, I think, is, is a very interesting one that we really could pick up on. And I could, I could say we've seen our community entrepreneurs suddenly realizing that they themselves have a lot more opportunities of selling and, and trading among themselves, uh, which has been quite an engine, I think, especially during this time. And I think it's it's a it's nothing new per se, but I think it was just a reignition of something we knew, but we haven't done 
enough of. Uh, and I think it comes back perhaps to one thing I'd like to talk about is, is how in, in many African countries see that there's this cultural distrust and how do we build that trust as an engine to do business together, to work together, to partner together. And I think what we're seeing right now perhaps to disrupt that because we just have had to get things moving and, and trust had to be kind of developed in a different way. Um, I'm still a bit intrigued on how do you build trust online? Is that even possible? Or is there this need to meet in person or that you literally have people vouch for you so you build a, a sense of a kind of trust brokerage, um, which I think is something we will need to look at as well. Um, and I think also perhaps going into how do we assemble our teams? How do we bring the right resources and talent? And perhaps this is a little bit more speaking to tech, but I think that's going to be disrupted completely. We're going to see teams and, and compositions of resources being put together completely differently. Um, I've had some chats around how we talk about working from home. And I keep on saying, maybe we need to change the narrative. A little bit said we're working remotely because then suddenly the world is potentially the resource base we have at our hands. It's not someone working from home or a home being just in my neighborhood. It literally could be anywhere and everywhere. And I think we need to still figure out how does that new work setting look like? And it's going to look very, very different. It's going to look at a way where we need to be a lot more capable of breaking down things into deliverables and then we're willing and able to pay for those deliverables as opposed to a traditional work setting and that i think in terms of, of mindset i know where we are at and most of us have been challenged to the brink of it and i think at the same time been very rewarding to see that there is a new way of doing things for sure uh, i think that does speak a lot to, to tech and i think we've also seen that perhaps the initial perceived opportunities were very much in tech i think it was a big push and issue to do education and health were definitely the forefront where I think we've seen. Um, I'm a little bit skeptical, to be honest, on how much we're going to see that driving great opportunities going forward. Also, because those two are traditionally very difficult sectors because they're very government uh, client focused. Uh, I think, though, we saw especially on the education side that there was a shift because government schools were not able to do and parents suddenly had to go and find what they could do in terms of education from other sources and I think that did give um, quite some opportunities and we'll then see how that's going to be sustained but at least there's a platform there for companies whether delivering the tech or the content um, that can drive them forward um, I'm perhaps a bit more skeptical on the healthcare side to be honest in terms of some of the sectors where I think there could be opportunities, I think you kind of have that aligned. A lot will need to be required in logistics um, because for some of this that what Jörg was talking about and what Mark was talking about, there will be a need to figure out how do we get the logistics to work and how do we definitely, if we are to have local supply compete with lower prices that can be produced at traditional volumes in, in China and other places, then we need to have some of these advantages come back in so we have a more even playing ground where people i think people are actually eager to buy local products um, and are willing perhaps also to pay a bit of a premium for that and i think there's a shift there that we need to make um, so i think that would be my thoughts on, on that i went really broad <laughs> no absolutely um, i think from uh, our experience that we've encountered you know we've all been forced into as york well mentioned it, and everybody else did you know, um, we've all been forced to work from home using tech. So I think there was a big push forward in the tech space in that regard. So um, Mark, from your view, you know, how's that going to influence the way people do business and entrepreneurs start up using tech? Do you think tech will be a, a challenge for them, you know, communication wise and so forth going forward? Yeah, look, I think it is a... <clears throat> Um, excuse me, I think it is a challenge that we face in South Africa, particularly with the cost of bandwidth. And um, I really like the idea of these trucks that Matsubishi mentioned earlier, these Wi-Fi trucks. So I hope you're bringing them to South Africa soon. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we particularly saw that during lockdown period, because obviously we had to close our physical incubators. We couldn't operate that. Um, and we moved to a remote platform, um, which worked very well. But the challenges were largely around uh, the cost of bandwidth 
um, the, the quality of the connectivity as well as load shedding. I mean, you know, we had significant periods of load shedding during lockdown. Um, quite a few of our businesses are based in Soweto and they were particularly badly hit by the load shedding. So I think within South Africa, we've got particular um, infrastructural issues that we face around running a digital economy. We are, I mean, obviously it's top of mind for us. We are currently developing a virtual incubation platform which goes live in about three weeks actually. So, so we are digitizing our business model as well, um, which will then be available to any business that has a device and connectivity but one needs to find an end-to-end -end solution. You can't just put the, the product out there and then expect everybody to be able to, uh, to access it. So I think something that's particularly relevant to our market is seeing how we can both provide that digital solution, but at the same time, empower the consumer to be able to access the solution. I think that's also, you know, one needs to think broader than just the solution itself in that environment. Um, I'm not sure if that answers the question. Sorry, my mic is muted. No, I think it does. I, I think, and uh, I'd like to hear everybody's views on that because from our experience, you know, when we encountered COVID and everybody was forced to be able to communicate and connect remotely from some of the most rural areas because of students not being on campus, entrepreneurs going home, you know, everybody, I think across the world experienced that, but specifically in Africa, I believe that was and still is a massive obstacle for us to overcome. Matabisi, what's your view on that? How will this influence the way entrepreneurs do business in Africa going forward? Yeah, <clears throat> um, uh, it's 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 double. It's a double-edged sword. I, I see a lot of people trying to adapt uh, the Wi-Fi digital space, but in um, not everyone is as fortunate because you know, like Wi-Fi penetration isn't that high in a lot of the space. Um, specifically in uh, luckily our, the government is trying to push uh, free Wi-Fi for the city of Habarongi, but that wouldn't necessarily address the less densely populated areas. Um, so they will always, there's always gonna be a level of exclusion, even in first world countries. So I guess there's no silver bullet for any, everything, but um, in terms of entrepreneurs pivoting, I see a lot of people trying to go into tech. They hear the word technology and think it's software and innovation, but to be honest, technology is everything. It's like your chair the spoon that you use, yeah. the prop that you make your porridge in, things like that, that is all technology. Because people have this perception that it has to be software and then it sort of sidelines extremely brilliant creatives uh, thinking that they have to be boxed in a specific way uh, to do or become great or even the, the word machine learning and they're like, yes, great, big money or AML, like it's, 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 quite, it's quite unfortunate. Um, but I, I see a lot of entrepreneurs just taking the steps towards self-education, like going online, doing soft, some, their own courses, Udacity, Udemy, various courses that, that are more affordable, um, trying to upskill themselves. I've seen a lot of that happening recently, uh, specifically whenever I put job applications out, people who apply tend to have a lot of online certifications versus now the traditional certifications, which is a very interesting shift mm. that I've noticed that people are doing, even though it's like one month courses, Courses, but it's still very interesting that people aren't just sitting down uh, doing nothing, they just want to upskill themselves. And, um, and yeah, and then with the entrepreneur space, I, I just want to let, let everybody know that being an entrepreneur, you don't have to, it's okay not to be an entrepreneur, right? Like, no one is going to uh, reprimand you for not being an entrepreneur. A lot of people tend to think, if I'm, an if I'm an employee, I'm failing in life. It's now becoming like a mantra, and it's like, no, no, that doesn't mean you're failing in life. They just said, it, like, not everyone's a doctor, not everybody is a uh, uh, surgeon. It's just how it is. And trust me, it's not as fun as it looks. <laughs> and you think you're going to have more time. In fact, you have no time, less time, if anything. Like Elon Musk said, it's like chewing glass and staring to the abyss and hoping there's light at the end of the tunnel. So it's, it's very, um, it's very difficult. So yeah, in terms of entrepreneurs, I just see them doing a lot of self-learning, trying to get into the tech space. I'm just letting them know that you don't need to go into that space to be successful during COVID. Like just uh, build relationships. That's the strongest way to build relationships. <laughs> I hope everyone could hear me because it's like frozen on my side. Yeah. <laughs> no, we got you. Uh, 
your from your perspective, how do you think the entrepreneurship uh, or entrepreneurial education uh, edutech space how's that going to evolve going forward? I know you're very passionate about entrepreneurship, and you know, you know, like I said before, you know, giving entrepreneurs those basic skill sets. But in in this environment where we are at, how do you think that's going to that's going to evolve going forward? Yeah, Charles, you're talking about uh, edu uh, entrepreneurship education. Yeah, edutech. Yeah, edutech and entrepreneurship education. Teaching so, well, well, first, I'm of a view that the, the system as it's currently set up is uh, not really functioning well. And uh, I don't mean that the people who teach entrepreneurship are, uh, are not well-meaning. They're, they're doing it with incredibly good intention, enormous hearts. But, you know, different people require different knowledge di delivered in different ways at different times <laughs> uh, to, to, to make a huge cliche even longer. <laughs> uh, so, so, you know, you, if you are starting, so for example, we launched uh, an initiative to help 10 million startups uh, access the right kind of knowledge at the right time. Now, when um, Ian, to take an example, a couple of years ago when he still had hair, he started his entrepreneurship journey. And just, I'm allowed to say things like that. Um, <laughs> when he started his entrepreneurial journey, he didn't need to know about HR policy, international expansion, multiple pricing mechanisms, uh, and so forth, what he, or managing a sales force. He needed to know knowledge to get him from idea to prototype to early day growth. And then you need somebody else to come on board to, who has different abilities, a complete different mindset to take the company to a whole new level. So this idea that we have to teach the entrepreneur the full um, spectrum of skills and abilities or knowledge to, for him or her to grow from, from startup right to multinational is nonsensical. So my, my, my future, if I had to make a long story short, the way I see the opportunities is, is, and I don't know what technology, maybe it's an AI, maybe it's a bot, maybe it's an interactive type form like a tool which interacts with Charles and says, hey, Charles, why are you here? And Charles says, well, I'm struggling with this. And then from that, we unpack it and then put you in touch with Black Umbrellas, a course on formalizing your business or pricing your products or what have you not. That's where I see EduTech going, not yet another platform, but more about saying, well, what is Charles needing? And when we did, when we, we did a project uh, three years ago in 83 countries, um, and we learned, funny enough, that an entrepreneur only has 11 needs. They may have different ways of being formulated, but there's only 11 needs you need to address for an entrepreneur. So it's not like you, it's an endless um, field of knowledge that they need to, to, to attain. So that's my view. That's a brilliant view. I like it. And I think, um, you know, all of us here on this panel are in the entrepreneurial support space on some level or another, but um, I think we all address it from a different angle and we have different views on it. But at the end of the day, I think we're all aiming towards the same sort of outcomes. Um, Ian, from your, from your side, um, if you look at what's out there support-wise for entrepreneurs currently in the market space, public, private, um, do, you, do you think there's enough of it? Do you think there's enough support for entrepreneurs out there in Africa? There's not going to be a blank answer to that. Um, I think some places there really are. Uh, I think we've gotten certain ecosystems and the Kenyan one we wanted in my mind has reached a saturation in terms of we don't need more we need better i think that's a also a theme that i, I really think is, is at the core of it is that some places we do need more that's acknowledged in other places we really need to start focusing i think there's a sense of a need to start specializing where it's fair enough that we operate in markets where there's always been a sense of perhaps lack of business so we were doing everything or doing too much to be able to do and there's a need now to start, and I think that's where the collaboration also start coming in, that we need to start really building ecosystems where we all have a place that we play, and that's where we are the best. Um, 
Otherwise, it's not going to move forward. We're going to just do things because money is available rather than doing it because this is where we each respectively can be most impactful. Uh, and I think that's really the journey we're going to have going forward in some places. And then there's a definitely countries where we still need to build a little bit more, but, but also that we need to get away with the idea that it's, just a, it's a volume game. Um, we need to be able to better deliver the right knowledge, the right service, the right support to entrepreneurs, depending where they are in their journey. And I think then getting back to, to perhaps a bit of, of what Job was saying, the sense as well of, of saying, I, I think we perhaps have, have overemphasized tech a little bit. I think tech and, and self-studying and, and learning from the internet is great at the earlier stages of your adventure. As you grow more and more mature, you'll need more one-on-one, -on -one, you need more curated services, and you probably will see, that we, we're definitely seeing an outline of work that the more mature your business is growing, the more you're going to need a blended uh, learning approach. Uh, a pure online is not the right, uh, the right pitch or the right uh, offering. And I think that's, that's also going to be exciting, that we don't have a, a one-size-fits-all through the whole value chain. I think AI and the likes definitely will come in and have a, a good play and deliver things at the earlier stages of your, your journey. I have a little bit of a, a question mark at times whether we've ended up where there's so much content and so much available online that the next thing is going to be the curation that almost as an entrepreneur, you Google something, you'll find 200 uh, great sources of content, but which one should I really look at? And I think it's almost to the point where the AI should help us then curate it into that learning program that would be mine, which is picking what would be the best fit for me. Uh, otherwise, I think we almost have an overload, an overflow of, of, of information and content that may almost be disruptive, though that was never the intent. Yeah, I think that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting perspective. Mark, from your experience uh, being in the uh, entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial support space in South Africa, do you think in South or Southern Africa enough is being done to stimulate and support entrepreneurship as a, an alternative to looking for employment? Yeah, sure. Sorry to put you on the I don't spot. Know if entrepreneurship is an alternative <laughs> to looking for employment. You know, it's that whole analogy um, in that it takes a special kind of person to be an entrepreneur. I mean, not that they're you know, special in the terms of, of being better, but special in the terms of being able to handle it. <laughs> um, it's, it's a very tough road. I, you know, a lot of um, people in trying, you know, to drive it, make it sexy, and um, but BC mentioned that as well. Um, you know, you have the sexy image of somebody driving a fancy car and your time's your own, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, it's very few people actually who can create a sustainable business out of an idea, you know, effectively. And those are the, the diamonds that we try and find. So it's that whole analogy where a good entrepreneur can probably make any business work. Well, not any business, but I mean, they can source the right opportunity and probably work on a variety of opportunities and different, you know, business models and types over their career. But it's, but it's very hard to make somebody who's not cut out to be an entrepreneur to make a good business idea work. And I think we've seen that a lot in the work that we do. We'd rather back the person, you know, than the business idea. Obviously, you want to see the differentiation in the market. And that is something that's a bit different about the Black Umbrellas model. We're not that involved in early stage. Um, we're more involved in helping people to learn how to run a business well, effectively. And, and it's something that York mentioned earlier as well. The most important thing is your uh, networks, your markets. And I don't know if you mentioned finance, York, but, but those are the three things that you know, we drive businesses towards or their development towards is meaning, uh, to get to a level where they can get meaningful access to all of those. So it's almost like, you know, and that's something that we don't see in the space either. It's almost like a sports scenario. You know, if you look at sports around the world, and probably to a lesser extent in South Africa, which is also maybe symptomatic of this not happening in the entrepreneurial environment, but you have your talent scouts out there at an early age, you know, at the soccer field on a Saturday morning, identifying potential talent. You know, they then earmark, they're referred on, they go into specialized clinics, 
you know, they work with people around developing their skills and abilities. If you're at high school, you know, you, you receive specialized focus, additional training um, to improve your performance. And there's a, there's a guided development path for you, which is focused on your natural inherent abilities but teaching you how to use your natural skill within the environment within which that activity happens. So it's a bit of a long-winded explanation. And we don't see that with entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is kind of, well, you know, good luck here things are, there's a couple of options out there. Hopefully you choose the right one. So I think there's a lot more work that can be done in that area. But for me, the key thing is the person behind the business really. Um, that's what we look towards and that's what's gonna make the business work. And um, I BC mentioned that as well. Business is all about relationships. So that networking you know, part is key, it, you know, it's critical. And a, a lot of the businesses that we support don't necessarily come from the networks that can help you know, kickstart and leverage what they're doing to be able to get this, a level of scale and acceleration that they need. So being able to facilitate that networking platform through the work that you're doing is also key. Agreed upon that. I think, um, Matabisi, what's your view from what support do you think or what do you know of that's out there for entrepreneurs to tap into during these times of crisis? What, 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 what should be out there if it's not? Um, I think what is out there is that there are a lot of corporates trying to help entrepreneurs, right? Uh, like, for example, Stambik offers an accelerated space. I think also it's standard in South Africa, but Stambik in, in Botswana and other yeah subsidiaries um they have like an accelerator that is free to come into like it's, you walk in you said you can house your team of three or four people and there's no application process currently obviously they're developing it but that allows you to now i guess early adopters you obviously get the first line of whatever comes in so you can now scale your business quicker so i think a lot of other businesses like other banks other uh, institutions are trying to do things like that where they're trying to offer spaces that allow people to come through maybe obviously at a fee but in this case this is just a, 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 a unicorn where it's free but um it allows individuals to like come together build ideas and like push your because office space is an issue and stable internet connectivity is also a very big issue so when you have those two things together yeah obviously equipment can be also a problem depending on what space you're in but that's something that can always be mitigated because some of these spaces do have uh, computers that you can use. And some of these corporates are trying to help out in the space. So it's that meeting where the corporates advertise or not even advertise, but communicate this value that they want to give to the entrepreneurs, but as well as trying to protect risk because most people look through the lens of risk and not the lens of opportunity. And they're always like, oh, how much money is this gonna bleed? What is this gonna happen? We're gonna, there's always negative, negative, negative. There's so many ways to die. We're always gonna die. We're even gonna look lucky to be alive right now. So like, if we're always gonna look at the risk perspective of things, it's gonna be very, very hard to grow and expand because a lot of the times people just, angel investors in exa for, as an example, can just give you money just purely based on your character. And those tend to be, Yes, they can be a great loss. I'm not saying be naive, but like you can also get a really, really huge return. Because if somebody, like if we came to me with Airbnb's idea today, I would still be like, strangers in my house, even though I know it's successful, I'm still like, strangers in my house. <laughs> so it's just very, it's just, it's just one of those things where you just have to take the risk. It's more like being less lens of risk and lens of opportunity kind of thing. What support corporate. do you, I get mm -hmm. uh, what support do you think should be out there for entrepreneurs in Africa? What, what, is, what, what is missing at this stage when it comes to support? Um, what is missing is that when an, an institution or an organization wants to build this entrepreneur, for example, at the end of it, that same institution will never engage that entrepreneur for jobs or work. Like, let's say they want digital media advertising. If, there's, if they're hosting a digital agency, they're not going to engage them. So what, that, what does that show you about this support thing? It's just like, no, we're just gonna bring you up and you go. No, if they're so good at what you're doing, then you should be willing to bet your life or your contact list or your clientele to service your people. These people should be able to service your people. So like, that's already access to market based off the backing of whatever institution it is. Over and above, if they're so good at what they're saying they're doing, are you as an institution willing to A, invest? I'm not saying be a venture capitalist, but invest in equipment, in 
facilitating salaries for X amount of months, all those kind of things. Like if you really do believe in what you're doing and training these entrepreneurs to be, help them, fund them, give them access to market in that regard. Because it is, it is difficult to have to build brand reliability when you guys already have it and you're trying to build us, then if that's the case, how engage in that regard, like engage like that. Let the branding of your company or your institution be done through the people that you're hosting. Let them create content, let them do the blogging, let them get paid for that. Like that is something that I would think would work better because a lot of the times it's very isolated. It's you come out of here, now go to venture capitalists. You come out of here, now go to stock exchange. You come out of there, it's like very siloed and not like just a linear um, conjoined kind of thing. Mark, what's your view on that? Do you think what's what's missing in in support for entrepreneurs in Africa? Um, do you mean in Africa as a whole, or the ability to scale yourself throughout Africa? Yeah, Africa as a whole, uh, or regional based. What do you think is missing in the entrepreneurial support space? What is it, what do you think could be done for entrepreneurs that we are not doing? Look, um, I think the development, you know, the ecosystem is key. Um, uh, yeah, just, I mean, support in all the areas, really, coordinate support and maybe a journey that the entrepreneurs, you know, can follow. I don't think it's, it's that clear, you know, in terms of if I'm scaling my business and I'm now moving, you know, from this level to that level, who supports me at this, you know, stage of the journey? Um, and where can I get that enhanced support that I need? So I think that's, um, that's something that's quite key. Um, and I think we need to focus on uniquely African solutions as well. Because um, we've got this huge disparity, I suppose, between a certain sector of the population, you know, who don't have access to a lot of the resources, um, but there's still a market within that. And that's probably where the largest market is effectively. So how do we get the the ideas and the entrepreneurs out of that sector and then convert it into something that's scalable, you know, impactful. Um, so, so maybe just give an example of that. Uh, we're currently working with a, um, a technology platform called Grow Nation, which is focused on small scale farmers. And what it does, it, you know, it's basically an app, but it uses the, the geographic location and topography of the land, uh, sorry, topography of the land to predict the yields based upon, you know, if certain, um, certain interventions were, were introduced. Um, and then um, they've got offtake agreements, you know, with some of the FMCG companies. And what it does is it is, um, 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 enables the, the small scale farmers to then aggregate, you know, and, and sell into the more established markets. But what they're lacking is the business development skills in terms of running their businesses efficiently, scaling their businesses. So that's where we come in as black umbrellas. So, you know, it's maybe looking at these uniquely African situations. How can collaborative organizations in their respective spaces work together to get a solution which is greater than the sum of the parts? So we're also working with another company called CRDC, the Center for a Regenerative Design and Collaboration. So they have a technology which basically um, converts waste plastic into an aggregate for concrete. Um, you know, so there's a whole circular economy there where we can bring in, you know, people right from the um, waste picker level right through to the factory into corporate supply chains. You know, so how can we start looking at those broader, expansive, circular economy collaborative solutions and who the role players in those spaces that we can bring in. So I think that's probably the key is looking at these integrated solutions rather than a vertical solution. Okay, uh, we, we've got a question here. So, you know, there's always this idea that entrepreneurs think there's no, there's no money available, funding is an issue, but from a funders and investors perspective, there's a lack of good ideas. Um, Ian, what's your take on that? Um, can you answer that or give us an, you know, what's your view? Good ideas versus, you know, no money available. That we've got two perspectives here. What's your view on that? Yeah, that's it. The money is always there if the team and the 
the opportunity is right. And I'm, I would believe in that to the end of days. Um, but I also say that money is not a Swiss army knife. There's definitely the perception sometimes that that is the number one on my list. And if I just have money, I can buy or do the rest. And I think perhaps sometimes when you, well, I know we need to approach that differently. And there are definitely ways where we could get money that does not necessarily require that. I mean, as was mentioned at the beginning, if you, if you go and acquire clients, that's money. And I think a lot of times there's perhaps a little bit of an overemphasis on, on investment capital as opposed to other ways of, of driving revenue or, or financing your business. Um, that's not to say, and I, I think I also started off with that, that during these times, it's not gotten any easier to raise uh, funding for African startups. I don't think though necessarily it's gotten a lot harder. And I think that we're also going to see investors coming back. I think there's a lot of uh, international organizations institutions that are going to use this as a as a conversation starter for how how do we perhaps also address some of the gaps that we've had evidently in the the money flows. Um, I must say I've, I've probably been a little bit discouraged on a lot of the free money that's being flashed flashed right now on anything COVID. Uh, small pockets of five, ten thousand dollars, and I think, unfortunately, we can see a lot of that will not have any impact. It's it's definitely going to be seen to be that we've done something, but in terms of impact and something lasting, I think we're going to be very disappointed. Also, because a lot of money comes without any technical assistance or any support, and we just have to accept that there is a lot. If you haven't dealt with money and don't know how to deploy it well, there's a lot of potential pitfalls for that that we need to help and support that that money is being invested where it will serve the business best. Um, so I, I do think that money, advice, network, a lot of other things are, are and should be glued together. They're not, it's not a one thing. It, it is a package of things that will add up a lot of value. And as you then grow the business, I think the appreciation of that will, will definitely grow with that as well. Um, but yeah, bottom line is I'll stick the right team, right business, right opportunity it is at the center. It's not money. Money will be and can be found with that right uh, opportunity. Yeah, no, I think we all agree. Jörg, um, from your experience, what mindset, well, mindsets, tools and strategies, uh, you know, will be helpful for young entrepreneurs to emerge from this uh, crisis. Uh, any thoughts on that? What do you think the strategies would be applicable? So I'm going to give a very biased answer because this is my field of expertise. So obviously, uh, you know, um, go visit 10 different doctors in 10 different fields and you'll have 10 different diseases and ailments. Um, so the first thing is mindset. I would sum it up as follows. I, I came up with a sentence and, I, and it's because I started a number of businesses uh, and some of them were, were spectacular failures. Like literally, if any, if any of, the, of the people today listening and want to learn how to screw up a business quickly, I'm an expert. So the point here was that entrepreneurs are neither born nor made. Entrepreneurs are panel beaten. And what I mean by that is if you know that it's not going to be a smooth journey. And every setback, every no is not a slap in the face or a reflection of who you are, but you realize that it's just the market's way of giving you feedback. When Charles says, no, I'm not interested in your fresh vegetables, in your uh, cool new mouse or phone covers or whatever, it's not Mar uh, Charles saying, York, you're an idiot. It's just Charles saying, look, either the price is wrong or the timing is wrong. So if you approach life in general, but also entrepreneurship as a wonderful business school, as an educational opportunity, that is why so many people advocate that you have to have had a few businesses behind you because nothing teaches you like actually walking the road. And um, in terms of skill sets, Look, it's been alluded to a few times in our, panel, in our panel today. Access to markets, meaning finding clients, which is my expertise, is probably the single biggest skill set you can develop. Because on the back of clients or prospects, you know, Ian invests in businesses at a high scale. Mark has a whole infrastructure, a phenomenal infrastructure with black umbrellas dedicated to support entrepreneurs. 
But if you go to Mark or Ian and say, I have an idea, it's one thing. If you go to Ian and say, I have an idea and here's 180 people who are interested if I bring it to market, you know, you, you're now sitting on gold. Uh, profit share partners in Johannesburg finances invoices. If you have a client who's interested, um, and it doesn't matter, even a township client, it doesn't have to be a registered business. Uh, you know, the financing world has changed dramatically. You can go to them and say, hey, I want to buy 100 sneakers. I think I have 200 potential customers. Are you up to buying? They will finance the sneakers, lock them in a warehouse they control, and release the stock as you bring the customers. So there's many different ways to go to market. The point is, without knowing for sure that you have interest from the market, not what you think a market wants. Uh, that's why my focus is on access to markets. And that's why I wish more entrepreneurs would spend at least uh, thumb suck, 40 to 50% of the days creating those connections, which Ian alluded to, uh, to build networks. I think we're all in agreement on that one. Um, guys, we're running out of time. We've got 10 minutes left. I think uh, in final, uh, in closing of, what, can each of you give us a piece of advice of wisdom from your own experience uh, for African entrepreneurs to take with them going forward. Uh, let's start Charles, with you, Ian. Hi, Sunita. Sorry to interrupt. There's one question sure. from uh, from an entrepreneur here. Yeah. He was looking for guidance on, you know, how do you work with governments if government is okay. a core customer for you? Mark, any input from your side on that? <laughs> Why did I deserve that question? Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, look, governments are challenging. I mean, obviously, I mean, I can only speak, you know, for South Africa to a large extent, but there is a, there is a um, large motivation in the country to bring more small businesses into the government supply chain. But obviously, governments are, you know, um, in terms of the way that they're procured, they're governed by the respective regulations yes the triple p if they may act effectively there's a process that needs to be followed it's very rigorous you also have to get onto the government um, supplier database to be registered as supplier before you can start accessing opportunities so the question is quite broad i'm not sure um, which angle it's coming from but i suppose in essence that um, there are a lot of compliance requirements. So probably the first thing is to get all your compliance in order as a small business, um, because you're going to have to be properly registered for tax, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, your returns up to date. So, you know, get your compliance in order. Um, you're going to need to go through a bidding process. Um, it's invariably out on a tender, of, you know, RFP. Um, and depending on the level that you're dealing at, whether it's a municipal or, you know, national, or provincial, you know, they each have their different processes in that regard. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if that helps, Charles. The question was quite broad. Yeah. No, I, I think we get the message, um, you know, myself having worked with governments and working with entrepreneurs, I understand there are challenges, but I also think there are massive opportunities. But I, my view is that entrepreneurs should not base their businesses on government, working with governments yeah. alone. They should diversify in, and make sure that they've got a a broad uh, client base from private uh, as well as from government sectors. Um, but basically, we've got a specific question raised towards yourself. Uh, the, the question was, uh, is, 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 was fundraising a challenge for your business? Yeah, that is a very interesting question, actually. <laughs> because fundraising, I personally have never been like a capital injection, like from a company or an individual, like, hey, guys, I want to invest in your company. No, but the strategy or my go-to-market strategy was win competitions, get some capital, build the business, <laughs> literally. Um, that is, I would not advise people to use that model because it's a lot of, it's, it's, it's just hard. <laughs> but like uh, by doing that, it helped me build certain systems, processes, like my pitch deck, my financials, my business strategy, like my customer segments, it made me really just understand what I'm trying to build and what I'm trying to build. So if indeed I ever did want to pivot to a real investor, I would get, I might get funding. So um, fundraising, because I haven't actually said, hey guys, can someone invest in my company? 
this is purely just out of the fact that I know there's always going to be some type of red tape. There's going to be a lack of control on certain things. When I have a certain vision, it's just going to go left. Like how Elon Musk is pushing Tesla and SpaceX. That's why SpaceX is not on the stock exchange because of that very reason. So it's just like the, that kind of thing where you still want to have creative freedoms, but you do need the capital. And yeah, so fundraising is being hard is it's it's a, it's a double-edged sword. It just depends on what product we're trying to raise funds for. Because Digital Natives does has a suite of different solutions that we've developed. Um, but Digital Natives itself, a lot of people did want to invest in it. Uh, I would rather than invest in some of the products that we've developed because those are their own entities in the end versus the mother company. Excellent. Guys, I think a uh, quick, short, focused, uh feedback from each of you and we're going to start with you york what piece of advice wisdom would you like to share with african entrepreneurs going forward <clears throat> okay so i think my one piece of advice would be to as uncomfortable as it is stop being a jack of all trade stop being a mechanic a dentist a spaza shop owner and an it guy and the ceo of a next company put yourself in a box focus i know it's uncomfortable we all want to be important but the more focused you are and the easier it is for people to know and more importantly remember exactly what you do the easier it is for you to find clients and get people to refer you people don't know what you do they're not going to send clients your way so focus and make it incredibly easy for people to understand what you solve Mark, from your side? Um, I think the audience today are probably in the best position out of all of us. And, you know, that they, you know, probably all have ideas or very early stage businesses, you know, whereas somebody like Black Umbrellas has been building this juggernaut over the last 10 years. And now we have to use all those analogies in terms of changing, you know, the wheels on the bus while it's still going, repairing the airplane while it's flying, et cetera, et cetera. So I think they're brilliantly placed in terms of uh, the opportunities that are arising out of the situation. And I think the thing is just to be aware. Um, I read a quote the other day that said, live your life as though the traffic light is always on amber effectively. So, um, so just, be aware of what's happening in your surroundings. And business is all about people, you know, effectively. Build those relationships, you know, treat others as you would like to be treated. Because that's all people are really looking for in terms of the product, you know, service that you're providing. So, um, and you never know where the next, um, next opportunity may be. So I think as your mentioned as well, always be prepared, always have your pitch because you never know when the opportunity may arise to present it, and then you need to be ready. So be alert, be aware, be on the lookout. Um, a lot of synchronicity happens in our lives as well, and if we just open to that and aware of that, it's amazing how much can actually open up. Sorry, it was a bit long. Sorry, Mark, um, I think uh, I'm not sure if the problem is at my side or your side, but uh, we, we lost you there for the last second. But I think we got your message. Um, Ian, your view on this? Any, any advice, wisdom that you would like to share with the African entrepreneurs? I would actually pick the point that Mark was trying to make. So <laughs> I think definitely um, Think in relations, think long-term, not transactional. I think there's a lot of risk that we think very short-term, very relational, sorry, very transactional. We need to move into relations and we never know where the next customer is just now to feed into to Yoke's uh, right point. You never know where your next investor is. It's all in those relations and the relations of relations. So that's really invest, keep building that. That would, that would definitely be one thing. Then I think perhaps touch a little bit of what um, Mitabizi said, earlier, which I think is a good point uh, or strong point. I think that all of us need to find the right time when we are right for that entrepreneurial journey. That doesn't mean we don't have it, but I would never underestimate experience. And I think there is perhaps some where it makes sense to go out, get a job, get the experience 
uh, build some resources, and then your right time for that journey is a bit later. Uh, and that's not to say that you're not an entrepreneur, um, but just find that right timing that works for, for you. And I think we often, I know Charles, you definitely know this one. Uh, I think we often, in African context, we never talk about entrepreneurs. So I think we've, we're missing a point completely of what about the innovation that needs to go into bigger business or into SMEs. And I think a lot of young people could be that agent of change that, that may be a good step of both getting some, some chance to get some experience and at the same time also have an opportunity to infuse some of your ideas and energy into an existing business that and in principle could be your next client or could be your next investor or the next stepping stone once you're ready uh, to get out there. So that, that'd probably be my piece. And we lost Charles. <laughs> Yeah, I think we lost Charles. Uh, okay, where he's back? Uh, is he? Okay. No, Charles, no, I'm back, are you there? So I Good. am, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but the busy, right. as, an, as an entrepreneur, what do you think, uh, what advice can you transfer over to other entrepreneurs? Um, the, our journeys are all different, honestly, and it's very difficult to have a one-size-fits-all because I know I'm in the tech space. I can't really speak for the person who sells um, side road or somebody who develops um, what you call satellites, microsatellites that would be used to provide free Wi-Fi. Uh, they're, they're very, very different challenges and that's from um, just lack of self-understanding. A lot of the times we have these great ideas which you think are once off great and no one else has thought of it. There's a very high chance that a lot of people have thought of it. It's just they didn't have the same access as you. Um, and then we blame it on, oh no, it's the government. Oh no, it's my family, the way they brought me up. We keep blaming it on external factors and not looking internally. Uh, so I would advise that like a lot of the times we should really look at ourselves first and you're always the problem. If that person didn't give you business, you are the problem. I promise you, they're never the problem. It's always you. And if you keep having that lens. Valuable advice. You, yeah, sorry? Yeah, valuable when advice. Have, when you have that lens, it's very, it's very you tend to go a lot further because you realize nobody owes you anything. Like whether we can complain saying, go on the ground, be with entrepreneurs that have gone through this, speak to them, ask them what they need. Someone's gonna tell you they need Wi-Fi. The next day they need a brand new laptop and then a Ferrari. Before that, they just wanted food. And like their, their needs and wants are so very skewed. Guys, I think my connectivity is, is dropping at my end. I'm not sure. You don't know who they uh, are. Matabisi, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, can, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Could you guys hear me? Yeah, yes, we absolutely. Hear. We could hear you. Okay. Yeah, I was just saying, like, looking internally. I don't know, Charles, if your signal is still active. Can you hear me now? So I think he's having trouble, but the rest of us can hear you. All right, no problem. So I was just saying that, like, where we just need to refactor, rephrase, and reshape how we view our entrepreneurship. Um, in the various stages because I can't claim to know how it is to be in a different type of business because I do not know the different struggles, specifically talent, even just finding HR, human resources, no one teaches you how to fire and hire somebody. And I know that may seem like something so easy, like by hi, no, like somebody's sick, somebody's mother passed away, your designer has a, an abortion or something like that. Like, well, how do you handle that as a startup? Like, how do you speak to this person relate on a uh, psychological man like no one teaches you those things like that is like it, it's just there's just a lot that people need to like look back in and realize that hey it's not just the problems are just so various they're just so variant and very specific they're not just one blanket statement that hey do this and you'll succeed Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm not sure. Uh, I think Charles is having some difficulty, but nevertheless, this has been a very, very interesting uh, panel. I'm sure that one could continue for a much longer time. Uh, however, it is time to say goodbye, and I want to take this opportunity and thank all of you on behalf of the foundation, but also on behalf of all the participants that were here and uh, that were viewing your uh, panel on Facebook Live.
So thank you very much once again, and we hope to see you in some of our other programs. So thank no you. And, uh,